Thank you. <laughs> um, well, welcome. Good to see y'all. Uh, we have we have made it to the last the last session. Uh, appreciate you all. We are so glad that we're here. I'm going to end it with a bang. Um, before I get started, I just want to give uh, a couple points of gratitude. Um, thanks for the money uh, from, the Fully, <laughs> from the Fully Thrive Center and the John Templeton Foundation. It is, uh, I'm, I'm facetious a little bit, but it is a blessing to be able to do, um, do what I love and uh, not have to worry about um, paying participants and things like that. Um, I, have an, I have an awesome team, uh, so I don't work alone. I want to give a big thank you to my postdoc, uh, Kathy Johnson, um, three consultants who helped me with uh, these projects and ideas, Pete Hill, uh, Jamie Eaton and Steve Sandage, um, a couple of my collaborators <laughs> that we've sort of stuck together from grad school, Don Davis and uh, Daryl Van Tongren. And then finally, my, uh, my research assistant and grad student, Jen Farrell, who keeps me um, organized. I would, I would be struggling if it wasn't for her. Um, what I want to do today, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how I've been thinking about intellectual humility. Um, I was aware, kind of listening to some of these talks, uh, that I've been challenged a little bit in terms of how I'm conceptualizing it, but I'll tell you how, how I was doing it throughout this project. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about intellectual humility and religion and why I think it's tough to be humble, to be intellectually humble about our religious beliefs, values, and convictions. Um, I want, I'll present a little bit of data, uh, mainly focused on uh, the research question about whether uh, intellectual humility can help uh, promote or is it associated with religious tolerance. Um, and then uh, talk a little bit about a couple studies that are ongoing and a little bit about my thoughts moving forward and then we'll have some time for questions and discussion. Um, so before I get started, I just want us to, if you can, participate with me a little bit in, a, in an exercise. Um, I want you to think for a second about your own religious perspective, um, your own religious beliefs, values, convictions. Um, perhaps you, uh, you believe in a God. Perhaps that's important to you. Um, perhaps you're a part of a religious community. Um, perhaps you have a certain um, value system that comes from your religious perspective. Um, perhaps you believe that there is no God, and perhaps that's a, a pretty important part of your belief system and structure uh, in terms of how you view the world. Uh, perhaps. Uh, neither of those describe you. Perhaps you're committed to a, a, a not knowing stance uh, or something similar. Um, so think about that for a minute. Where do you, where do you sit in terms of uh, your perspective on religion? Um, how open, I'm curious, how open, think to yourself, how open that are you that maybe your perspective on religion is wrong? Um, are you pretty sure that you've gotten it right? Um, are you pretty sure that you're, you're at a place that you feel comfortable? Or, uh, perhaps are there things that you might be wrong about uh, in terms of your religious views. Uh, think about your life. Uh, uh, maybe fast forward a little bit. Think about where you might be a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now. How likely is it, do you think, that your religious perspective will be the same as it is now? Maybe on a broad level. Uh, maybe in regard to specific religious issues. Uh, how likely is it, do you think, that um, you might believe something different five years from now. If you, uh, if you believe in God right now, how, how likely it is that you maybe won't believe in God in five years? Do you think that's, do you think that's possible? Um, do you think it's likely? Also, um, think to yourself, you know, what if in the future your religious perspective did change? Um, what would, would, would that have any consequences for your life? Um, you know, perhaps you have a partner or a spouse who shares your same religious perspective. Might that cause problems um, in that relationship if your religious views were to change um, in a significant way? Uh, perhaps you're part of a religious community. What would happen if your religious views changed uh, in terms of those relationships? Um, perhaps you're part of a work community where most of your work colleagues share your perspective on religion. Um, would, any, would, it, would there be any fallout there if you were to change your religious views? Um, so anyways, keep that in mind as we go, as we go forward. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> so we lose your job, yeah. So there could, there could, could be some problems. Um, 
The one last thing I wanted to share before I get started with my talk is um, I think it's really important as, uh, as researchers, um, and I'm a counseling psychologist, that's my background, um, to kind of talk a little bit about what we bring to the table in terms of our perspective and, and possible bias. And so I think that's important for you to know where I'm coming from um, briefly. Uh, and so I grew up in a, in a, a, a context that was fairly uh, conservative religiously. I grew up in a, a conservative Christian household. Um, and I don't know that when I look back on my life, I don't know that I would always necessarily describe myself as religiously humble. Um, there were, especially uh, during college and maybe right after, um, I was pretty sure that I had it right in terms of religion and that my specific perspective was absolutely correct. Um, and uh, for those of you who know me, I'm a little, I'm a little bit intense. And so I was, um, not only did I think I had it right, but I was fairly certain that it was, it was important for me that others shared my religious perspective. So um, I was pretty active in uh, evangelism and things like that and trying to get people to believe what I believed in regard to religion. Um, I've also struggled a lot with religion, um, especially during grad school. Uh, and um, I went to a, a non-religious graduate program uh, that had very strong uh, values towards social justice and advocacy, um, especially for, uh, for example, GLBT, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender individuals, also strong uh, values toward um, respecting people from different religious perspectives. And so I started to develop these values in myself as well and struggled a lot with how that fit in with my uh, conservative religious perspective. There was a time in my life where I felt, you know, perhaps I just had to uh, maybe pitch being religious and, um, and be done with it. Um, so there, there's been kind of a lot of ups and downs throughout my story as well. Um, and I think I've gotten to a place where, um, where I'm more comfortable with where I stand. Uh, right now I, I attend um, uh, probably a liberal to moderate uh, Christian church. So that's, that's how I identify right now. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of bumps in the roads and there's, there were some shifts in, in my views over time uh, that weren't easy. So. All that to be said, moving forward. Um, okay, how I'm defining intellectual humility. I was aware listening to some of the philosophers talk that I maybe haven't spent as much time thinking about my definition as perhaps I should, um, but this is what I've been working with. Um, some, me and my, some of my colleagues have been doing some research on, on just general humility, and so we basically mapped on our thinking about intellectual humility onto what we've been thinking about general humility. So we've been thinking about general humility using two different parts. One is more of an internal, aspect, um, which we thought of as an accurate view of self, uh, including an awareness of one's limitations. And then we've also been thinking about a more social or interpersonal aspect of humility, uh, which we're call we were calling more of a, an other-oriented stance uh, rather than just being self-focused. So with our thinking about intellectual humility, we've kind of mapped that onto those two parts. Uh, so um, when I think of intellectual humility, I'm thinking of an accurate view of my own intellectual strengths and weaknesses, an awareness of my limitations to get it right um, in, in the context of religion, an awareness of my limitations to get, uh, to be absolutely certain that my religious beliefs, values, and convictions are true. Um, and then also uh, an interpersonal aspect of that, uh, you know, being open to other uh, religious perspectives that are perhaps different from my own. Um, and, uh, and there's an aspect there that we've been thinking about that's important in terms of being able to have ongoing discussion and dialogue with people who are religiously different uh, in an interpersonally respectful way. Um, so my sense uh, when kind of talking with other people about how they view intellectual humility, my sense is that some people maybe don't think the interpersonal part is as much core um, to intellectual humility. Maybe they view that as correlative. But we were kind of, we, in, in our project, we were viewing that as as um, an important component of intellectual humility. Um, okay, why religion? Uh, part, uh, part of the reason why I was interested in studying intellectual humility in the context of religion is that um, my sense is that we live in a very divided nation, world, society in terms of religion. Um, it's characterized by uh, religious conflict um, and uh, all, sometimes even resulting in, in war and violence. Um, and my sense is that it's difficult to uh, engage with your religious beliefs, values, and convictions with, with intellectual humility. Uh, so I thought it would be a good topic to, uh, to tackle. Um, you know, another point here, you know, my sense is that even if, uh, when you look at a lot of the conflicts or division in, in our society and country and world, 
Um, even if maybe the conflicts aren't necessarily religious per se, um, I think a lot of times religion fuels uh, perhaps political conflicts or um, national conflicts. Or maybe uh, another way to say that is sometimes I think that people almost maybe use religion to kind of intensify uh, emotions and reactions to various um, conflicts. So you can see that you know, if you turn on um, you know, the Sunday morning news programs, you see people, um, very, I think, very intensely divided uh, in terms of re uh, religious issues, almost to the point where we don't usually talk about it, right? It's kind of, let's just leave that aside. If you're on a date with someone, you don't usually talk about religion or politics. It's just too, too contentious. Um, uh, related to, I, I touched on this just, just briefly before, I think it's difficult to engage religion with intellectual humility. Um, and I think there's, there's perhaps some reasons why that I want to touch on uh, for a couple minutes before I get into the data. Uh, and uh, this is another reason why I wanted to study intellectual humility in this area. Um, similar to the idea that uh, I think sometimes virtues are best studied in situations where it's difficult to uh, act on in that way. So for example, if you want to study courage, um, you shouldn't look at me kind of relaxing on the beach at on Catalina Island, right? You need to study me in an aspect of um, perhaps danger or a context of danger. Uh, in the same way with intellectual humility. Um, you know, a lot of times we're in situations, I think maybe even in our, our occupation, or I know I am sometimes in my occupational life where I'm, I surround myself with people who agree with me. Um, you know, may, in, in terms of religion, maybe I attend religious services. I, I find a church or, or setting that kind of fits with me, that people generally believe the same as I do. Um, and so perhaps maybe we're not challenged as much. Um, but when you, when you engage with someone who's religiously different, I think it could be um, a setting where intellectual humility could really uh, shine. Um, why is intellectual humility tough? A couple reasons I um, and my colleagues have been talking about. Uh, one is I think that um, religion uh, often is, is kind of a load-bearing belief for people. It maybe organizes in the structure of one's worldview and life. Um, I was reading an author once and they uh, said that often he called people have what he called a brick wall type of faith where each conviction or religious belief or value is, a, is, a, is one brick in um, organizing one's religious structure or world, world view. And if you kind of doubt it, had some, casted some doubt or tsh -tsh, knocked out one of the bricks, the whole wall might uh, crumble down. And I think that's the case with some people's religious perspectives. Um, they have a, a, an intersecting or interlocking uh, set of beliefs, values. And if you're humble about something, if you're, if you're kind of acknowledging that there might be some limitations in your ability to get it right or that you might be wrong on something, um, I think sometimes there's a fear that uh, you know, the, whole, the whole structure could crumble. Um, sometimes I think religious beliefs signal loyalty to your group. Uh, and so, uh, and, and religious groups are often very important to people. And so sometimes I think if you're humble about a religious <coughs> belief or, or maybe you're questioning um, some aspect of your religious view, uh, it might be a signal that your loyalty to your group is maybe flagging. And so I think that's another reason why it's difficult perhaps to be humble about your religion. Um, you know, I, I, I experienced this uh, when I was going through graduate school and I started talking about the fact that maybe my beliefs on certain things were shifting or changing. Um, uh, for example, I was talking with a friend and, and sharing about how I thought my views on gay marriage were changing. Um, and there was kind of some thinking like, ah, you know, or, or is psychology making you too liberal? Those sorts of things. So, and I think that happens um, a lot for folks. If they start thinking about changing their mind on certain things, it's almost like they're being disloyal to their group. Uh, this is a point I thought was kind of interesting. It was, it was part of my religious tradition growing up in that I think some faith perspectives equate, uh, some religious perspectives, perspectives equate like how good your faith is with how certain you are that what you believe is true. Um, it's almost as if uh, one author I like, he used the analogy of at the amusement park, that thing where you hit the hammer and you try, maybe you try to impress your date by hitting it all the way to the top. Um, and he was saying that in some religious perspectives, uh, and he was speaking mostly of Christianity, um, that if you, if you have a certain level of belief uh, or certainty, maybe you're, uh, you can be saved. You, know, you can uh, get to heaven when you die. If you, have, if you have more, 
uh, certainty, then maybe you have enough faith where your prayers can be answered, um, etc. And if you have the mac, if you hit the faith puck all the way to the top, then maybe whatever you uh, maybe pray for or claim uh, in the name of God, that it will it will happen for you. So there, there's this idea, and I think that makes humility difficult. If you if if your faith is measured by how certain you are that what you believe is true, then what does it mean when you start to question some of your beliefs or you think that you might be wrong um, on certain things? Okay, um, I actually some of the basis for this project was based on uh, my reading of a philosopher named Philip Quinn. Did the, is that a famous philosopher? I don't even know. Have people heard of him? I, I maybe should have checked that out. I don't know if he's respected or not. But he forms the basis of my entire project. So, um, <laughs> Anyway, so I, I was reading um, the, uh, basically a, a, a collection of essays on, um, on humility and religion. And uh, what he basically talked about is he tried to link um, exposure or engagement with religious diversity, intellectual humility, and religious tolerance. And kind of what he said is that if you, um, he believed that if you have a serious, if you have a serious consideration of religious diversity, maybe, meaning you really stop and think about the fact that you believe, uh, you know, maybe one thing, and other people maybe perhaps just as smart as you, just as wise, just as learned, just as committed to truth, believe something different, you have to, um, you basically have to face the fact that there might be some limitations or weaknesses in how you justify your own particular religious beliefs or lack thereof compared to others who believe differently, uh, who may be just as smart as, as you. And so we thought that process should lead um, individuals, if they seriously, if they have a serious consideration of the religious diversity in our world, um, to be intellectually humble about their own religious beliefs, values, and convictions. And then he thought that to the extent that a person becomes intellectually humble about their own religious beliefs, values, and convictions, they should um, acknowledge uh, perhaps that other people should have the right to, uh, I guess, practice their religion or hold their own set of religious beliefs and, and be able to practice it unencumbered. Um, so that was, that was his thinking. And that, and that sort of led to some of the, the research questions that I asked in my, in my project. And I was curious. I, I mean, I think we have a problem with religious um, division, conflict, and lack of tolerance in our society today. So I was wondering, you know, perhaps could intellectual humili humility be one way that we can help people um, be more tolerant of each other and, and live in a more peaceful society that is, um, uh, that is uh, pluralistic in regard to religious um, perspective and um, likely will be, continue to be that way at least um, throughout my life and probably in, in generations to come. It's, it's kind of the reality that we're dealing with. Okay, what um, I want to walk through a little bit of data uh, and some some projects that we ran that um, I hope will um, yeah shed some light maybe on some of these questions. Okay, so first of all, um, I just wanted to present a little bit of data looking at uh, different sorts of ways of being religious and intellectual humility. Um, our measure of intellectual humility had items uh, that kind of basically got at asking people to think about different religious beliefs and values and get at how open they were to consider those viewpoints, um, as well as um, there were some reverse coded items based on thinking that their religious perspective was better or superior. So it kind of gets at openness to different viewpoints um, and lack of superiority of one's own views. Um, we found no relation, and uh, we, had a, a couple different samples here, undergraduate students, uh, graduate students beginning seminary um, uh, at Christian seminaries, and then uh, uh, a sample of Christian pastors, uh, predominantly Protestant, uh, a, a low number of, of Catholic, mostly Protestant, low number of Eastern traditions, mostly Protestant. Um, we found no relationship between intellectual humility about religion and religious commitment, so kind of a general measure of just how, uh, how not use committed, how committed one was, but things like uh, you know, how often does a person attend services, read books about one's faith, how integrated in a religious community, questions like that. So no relationship between intellectual humility and commitment. Um, if you're familiar with uh, religious orientation, intrinsic religious orientation is valuing religion for its own sake. Um, uh, kind of a simple definition of that, but ex extrinsic, extrinsic religious orientation is valuing religion for the benefits that it gives you, so things like social support, uh, community, et cetera. Uh, quest religious orientation is sort of valuing religion as a journey, valuing questions, 
um, in seeing religious doubts as important and kind of incorporated into the part of the process. Uh, so no relationship between intellectual humility and intrinsic or extrinsic religious orientation. We see a positive relationship between intellectual humility about religion and quest. Um, and then uh, we also see a negative relationship between intellectual humility and religious fundamentalism, and that's um, like viewing your one particular religious perspective as absolutely right and correct. Um, and then also a negative relationship between intellectual humility about religion and conservative political values. Um, there's a part, and I'll talk about this a little bit before, uh, throughout my, my project. I, I kind of would like, moving forward, I'd like to be able to measure, because I think people are, can be uh, uh, non-intellectually humble in both directions in terms of religion, both pro-religion and anti-religion. Um, and so part of me was a little bit worried um, in terms of the measure I used of intellectual humility that maybe I'm, it's conflated with more liberal um, kind of just values because it gets at that openness. So anyways, I don't have a, I don't have a great uh, correction for that at this point, but that's one thing <coughs> I've, I've noticed in terms of my data. Um, a couple of just studies we ran looking at intellectual humility and religious tolerance. Um, the, in, in the self-report data that we have, the, the measure of religious tolerance that we used, uh, we followed, I don't, again, I'm not sure that it's the best, and I'll just tell you what it is, and then you can sort of make your own determination of how good you think this measures what you think of as religious tolerance. Uh, we used a measure that a guy named Robert Putnam used in his, he's, uh, I guess, I guess you think you'd call him a political scientist, um, but he's written uh, a, a few different books, uh, one recently on religion in America, and he used this measure of religious tolerance. And basically what he did was he had people, a few different questions. He had people answer how cold or warm they felt toward a variety of um, religious, uh, different religious groups. Um, he had them answer a question of uh, how, how able are people from d these different religious groups to attain salvation or get into heaven. Um, how, how likely it would be or how, how able a person from these different religious groups can be a good American, and also how willing or how positive you would feel toward um, a, one of these various religious groups putting a large building in your um, neighborhood. So it was a composite of those, and we measured that for non-religious groups, um, average together, and then also for atheists. And we did find a positive correlation between our measure of intellectual humility and um, religious tolerance, both toward atheists and toward uh, non-Christians, um, and these were samples of Christians. Um, also, just wanted to mention this one thing. We also asked people how diverse their social groups were. So we had them list their five closest friends and family members, and then uh, had them list what religion they were. And then we kind of calculated a composite score based on how many of those people were of a different religious group than they identified. And we found a kind of an uh, interesting, I thought, interaction between exposure to religious diversity and intellectual humility in that uh, um, the more people were exposed to religious diversity, that was linked to higher levels of religious tolerance, but only for people who were high in intellectual humility. That wasn't the case for people who were low in intellectual humility. So um, that kind of what that kind of told me is that just kind of contact isn't necessarily doesn't necessarily work to increase religious tolerance. There has to be some sort of openness or humility on the part of the individual um, for that contact to work. Um, it kind of reminded me, in psychology, there was this theory um, a long time ago uh, about intergroup contact um, that Allport proposed. Uh, and he said that um, intergroup contact was one of the best ways to reduce prejudice between groups, but there had to be some conditions uh, that were uh, present. Um, so for example, people had to be at the same level of power there were a few other things. So it kind of reminded me of that similar finding that you know, contact is good, but maybe there has to be some conditions. And maybe perhaps one of the conditions is the person needs to, be, has, needs to have a, a certain level of intellectual humility. Um, a couple other, uh, so this project wasn't actually uh, my team, but I wanted to include it anyway because it kind of applied. Uh, we, did a, we did a special issue last year in the Journal of Psychology and Theology about uh, humility and religion. And uh, Rick and his team uh, presented this study and showed some data that um, presented some data showing that intellectual humility uh, was related to less defensiveness toward um, an essay that uh, kind of went against the person's religious perspective. Um, and so that kind of, uh, uh, not really tolerance per se, but um, I, I think uh, another way of looking at it. Um, he also, uh, 
uh, him and his team also measured um, religion, like pro-religious attitudes as well as anti-religious attitudes. Um, and so I thought that was kind of a, a, a cool measurement step that we don't often take uh, in this and that I, I hadn't really looked at much in my project um, and found that intellectual humility uh, was, re was negatively related to the more intense views on each side. Um, so they had a, if you went to his talk, they showed a lot of nice curvilinear graphs. I don't have a nice graph here, but you can just kind of picture that. Um, picture, picture a little hill. Yeah, picture a little hill. That's, that's what we had. Um, OK, so one of my colleagues, Daryl Van Tagren, he's at Hope College. Uh, and he's an experimental psychologist. So um, a little bit, I'm a counseling psychologist. He's, he's more in the lab, so I appreciate that he kind of does that work so I don't have to. Um, but he's, he's been, we've been running some, some studies uh, in the lab on this. And I wanted to share with you a couple of findings that he had. Um, one was, this actually wasn't in the lab, this was just online, but he had people uh, talk about their um, cherished religious, cultural um, worldviews, and then uh, had people just imagine uh, what it would be like if someone at attacked those um, or was very negative toward the, your own religious um, and, and cherished cu cultural values. Uh, and then he measured intentions toward aggression um, toward that person. So not aggression per se, but just intentions. And uh, found the, uh, the predictive relationship between intellectual humility and intentions toward regression, that people who were more intellectually humble about religion were less likely to at least intend to behave aggressively. And then he had this other, pro other uh, project that he did that I, I, to be honest, I did not, I was very surprised that this actually worked out. Um, but it did, and so I was like, wow, couldn't believe it almost. But maybe you're not gonna believe it either, but it did. Um, he brought people into the lab, had them write, and these were uh, Christian um, students at Hope College, R had them write about their uh, kind of core religious values, um, and then he had them, uh, he told them that they were gonna have, do this a series of tasks with, a, with kind of a, a partner, um, and they were paired with someone. And they, and they uh, were told that they were going to switch essays and then rate each other's essay. And so they were given an essay. Uh, there wasn't actually technically a part. It was just a, a stock essay that was very anti-religious. Um, so they were given this essay that was anti-religious, that was ostensibly this other person's view. Um, and then they were also told, after they rated the essay, they received the ratings from the other person and were told that they were rated you know, very low. So the other person had this anti-religion -reli essay and then didn't like their essay either. Um, then they were doing, uh, they were doing kind of a, uh, a distraction task on the computer, uh, just like a, a word. Basically, they were uh, had something pop up and they had to say whether it was a word or number. Um, that that part of the study wasn't important, but what was important was in that they were primed for I think 20 um, milliseconds. It's really short with either humble words or just neutral words. So they, so they were put into different conditions based on that. Um, so then they came back. Uh, and I think, well, I think that happened, and then they rated the other essay. Uh, and then, um, so they rated the other essay, and then they also were told that they had another part of the study where they had this, they were, this food, they, had, they were doing something with food, and they were assigned to the food preparer role, and the other person was assigned to the food eater role. I think they called it something better than that. But, um, and they had to prepare all this, the, this food for this, for this person. Um, and they got this, Thing saying what the person's food preferences were, and one of the and there's a bunch of different food preferences, but one of them was that he didn't like the person didn't like spicy food, um, and so as part of the food preparation, they had to pour kind of like a, a amount of hot sauce with these crackers. Um, so, anyways, long story short, the people who were primed with humility put less hot sauce um, for the food eater than the people who were not primed with humility. Um, Anyways, I don't know how much that applies to you know, uh, what the Supreme Court is, is deciding about gay marriage, but um, you can kind of connect the dots. But it worked. I was, I was actually really surprised that that, that happened. Uh, OK, moving on to a couple other studies. We did some studies looking at, for, uh, so I'm, I'm a forgiveness researcher. Also, that was actually how I started before I got into humility. And so we looked at some studies that examined forgiveness of a religious hurt or um, a religious offense. Uh, and so one study we did was we had people uh, think about a, a religious leader who had committed an offense either toward them personally or toward kind of the congregation that they were a part of. And then we measured um, 
a person's ratings or perceptions of how intellectually humble the, the religious leader was and then measured forgiveness. And so we found that, um, it, you might, ex and maybe this isn't super groundbreaking, but people who perceived the religious leader as more intellectually humble were more likely to forgive the religious leader, even when we controlled for general levels of humility. Uh, we also found an interaction. I went in and coded, um, actually I didn't, some undergrad, <laughs> some grad, some of my assistants went in and coded um, how, like what kind of offense it was. So what I was thinking uh, was that intellectual humility might be especially important for offenses that involved specifically religious beliefs, values, and convictions. Um, and so that hypothesis uh, showed up. So if, um, it was actually kind of a small percentage of offenses that involved that, maybe I think eight or 10% if I'm remembering correctly, so were things like, you know, I came out as gay and my um, religious leader said that I was going to hell, or, you know, I wanted, to, I was a woman and wanted to be a pastor and my religious leader said that, you know, women can't be pastors because it's, you know, against what the Bible says, et cetera. The others were things like, um, I guess, uh, you know, things like, you know, there was maybe a sexual indiscretion or a financial uh, offense toward the church or things like that. Um, we also did a study where we looked at, we asked specifically about religious conflict, um, so, uh, or religious hurt. So think of a time where you were hurt and it involved religion, and then we had people rate their own intellectual humility about religion toward the person who hurt them, and also perceptions of the offender's intellectual humility toward their religious perspective. Uh, both of those were positively linked to forgiveness. I also had a hypothesis with this study that maybe there would be an interaction with religious commitment. So I thought that maybe for people who were really strongly religiously committed, um, the intellectual humility might be more important toward forgiveness. And that didn't come out. So um, it seemed like intellectual humility toward religion predicted forgiveness irrespective of the person's religious commitment. Um, and my take on that was uh, kind of what I talked about before is that um, you know, maybe even for someone who's not religiously committed at all, they might still have uh, pretty strong feelings about religion just from the opposite side. And so perhaps, you know, intellectual humility toward religion is just as important when they're dealing with a religious conflict. Um, okay, uh, I have a couple more minutes. Just want to touch base briefly on a couple of data collections that aren't finished yet, uh, so I don't have those data. Um, but I mentioned before we did some seminary, a study on seminary students. We actually followed them longitudinally over two years. So that data will be um, finishing up here in just uh, not very long at all. And so kind of my thinking here was I thought that seminary might be an interesting time to study intellectual humility because on one hand, um, people are consolidating their commitments in some ways because they're becoming, this is their career, they're becoming a pa training to be a pastor. Um, but on the other hand, there's some uh, research that uh, a colleague of mine, Steve Sandage, did that showed that uh, seminary can be kind of a disconcerting time for folks. Uh, because it, for some, it's the first time they're introduced to religious uh, beliefs and perspectives that might be different from how they were, grew up. So, and also, they're taught by people who are pretty smart and, and pretty um, have a lot to back up their own, their particular perspective. So, um, I was curious, you know, does intellectual humility change over time over the course of, of seminary? If so, you know, what uh, variables might be related to more or less change? Um, also. I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up data collection on this study right now where I, I took undergrads at the University of North Texas where I work, and I had them uh, list their opinions uh, on a bunch of different religious hot topics. So like, what do you think of gay marriage? What do you think about abortion? What do you think about who gets into heaven? What do you think about like what the Bible means, et cetera? And then I, um, I took people who believed differently on something, and I brought them into the lab and had them do a disagreement discussion about that topic. Um, and I videotaped them and took their blood pressure, and then I had them do a bunch of questionnaires afterward. And um, so I'm curious uh, with that study, like, what does it actually look like, um, intellectual humility, about a difficult dialogue in regard to religion? Um, so, you know, I'm curious, you know, maybe people who are more intellectually humble ask more questions, or um, maybe uh, less intellectually humble people interrupt, or things like that. So we'll be able to uh, have some data on, on what that actually looks like in the lab. Um, also, we ask questions about closeness to your um, dialogue partner, and so I'm curious about, and some other things too, but I'm curious about like, you know, perhaps more intellectually humble people, um, they feel more close even when they're talking about this contentious hot, uh, religious hot topic. Uh, also, later on in the survey, I ask them, uh, I give them that same brief measure of like, what do you think about gay marriage, abortion, da, da, da. And so I'm curious, you know, perhaps if 
a person is in, it, perhaps if a person is more intellectually humble themselves, or maybe their dialogue partner is more intellectually humble, that they might be more likely to um, experience uh, a shift in their opinion. I don't know that that necessarily will come out, but I think it would be cool if it did. Um, 10 minutes, OK. I'm, I'm almost on my last slide. Uh, so moving forward, I think uh, there's some evidence in this series of studies that in terms of thinking about religious tolerance, intellectual humility might play a part um, in, in promoting that. Uh, I still think we ha I have some questions about what does it look like to hold uh, strong religious convictions with intellectual humility? Uh, is it possible to really strongly believe something but also be open to a different perspective? or um, what does that actually look like? Uh, I have a little bit of fear, or not fear really, but wondering if I'm maybe conflating intellectual humility with just kind of liberal values. Um, and I, I would like to have talk about intellectual humility in, in such a way where it applies to both sides of the spectrum. Um, and a little bit getting into that, you know, I'm wondering if, if maybe part of the answer is differenti differentiating the content of one's religious belief with. Uh, with the style in which one holds a belief or how one engages with others who are religiously different. Um, I think that's it. Uh, let me stop there and uh, then we have questions. Yeah. 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 As I said here, I thought about my own humility and arrogance on a lot of these things. Uh, as you were talking, a distinction occurred to me that I had never thought about before, and I'd like to get your thought on it. The difference between intellectually being intellectually humble about an idea that you disagree with that doesn't really matter, doesn't have any implications that the person believes that, versus situations, and this happens a lot with religion, I think, where the, it's not just that you disagree with the belief, but the implications of the belief have, have implications for other people. Yeah. So, you know, you know, if somebody wants to think a certain way about gay marriage, I may disagree, but I'm not affected by it unless they want to impose their beliefs on, on someone else. If you think about religious beliefs and humility and arrogance, is that a useful distinction? Because they are really almost two different categories of things that people are reacting to. And they can be very humble about one category, but very but less humble about the other. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I mean, I think that, and I agree that I think a lot of the reactivity against religion, um, at least in, in my field, in counseling psychology, has to do with the idea that um, like when religion, people who are religious kind of promote their viewpoint, it's almost kind of they're like taking away rights of other folks or they're not um, willing to let other people kind of be in a different place. Um, so I wonder, I mean, I wonder if that would be a moderator. Perhaps like you maybe could measure the extent to which um, the, I don't know if it would be, it would be different than how strongly you hold a belief. It would it'd be like maybe what are the implications of like the practical implications for society. Um, it also means when you measure it, it depends on what the respondent's thinking about. If they're thinking about a belief that really doesn't matter, they can say, well, I'm very intellectual, and humble, they can believe yeah. whatever they want. Yeah. But if they think of something that has downstream consequences, well, if their belief leads them to kill people, then they're probably going to be arrogant about it. So yeah, because it's, it's like we're not going to, we can't, we can't budge on that if someone's going to be killed. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I think it's a follow-up on that same idea, but I don't even think it's distinct to re religion, but if you have a social agenda like activism, yeah. how does that fit with intellectual humility? I think that's a good question because part of what it means to have a goal of changing society is you push a particular narrative that would lead to certain social effects. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I think, and, I, and I think that's a good point. I mean, I, I, so I wonder if, you know, there's a part of me that wonders perhaps in, in a situation like activism, maybe intellectual humility isn't as much of a virtue that's helpful. Um, there's a part of me, I can see the opposite side too. Uh, you know, I teach, I teach multicultural counseling um, and we talk about advocacy and social justice a lot in that course. Um, and something I try to, and a lot, of, a lot of people have very strong views on you know, a variety of things. Um, and, and one thing I say, I, don't, I guess I don't know that I have data on this to show that it's true, um, but one thing I try, to, I try to ask people to think about at least is um, to really, encourage, how, how can you best encourage someone to change? Like, let's say you want something to happen in society. Um, is, and my opinion is that people experience are more willing to change when you understand their viewpoint. And, um, and it's almost like I'm as willing to be changed by you as I expect you to be changed by me. 
um, that kind of idea. So I, I want, uh, and from that perspective, I wonder if intellectual humility maybe does have a place even within advocacy. Um, but that's just, uh, that's more of an opinion. I don't know if I have data. I don't think I have data on that. Is that a follow-up on that, or is it? Uh, yeah, it is. Okay. <coughs> a quick follow-up, and then. Oh, OK. I apologize. Uh, I mean, this could be a situation in which humility sort of wraps back on itself and increases conviction. If, if humility and is correlated or causes empathy, then that would be a situation in which uh, a situation, or, or there would be like a, a marginalized group or a sensitive group that is possibly harmed. And then that might, uh, because of the, the moral justification of defending this group, will actually increase conviction. Um, and, and maybe even seemingly reduce humility, even though it's rooted in humility. Mm -hmm. So this kind of bizarre wrap, wrapping back on itself and, and getting at this almost ironic effect. So, so you're saying the humility toward some issue could create empathy for maybe the person who's being harmed in it. Which might actually strengthen the original conviction there. Yeah, or, or the need to fight for this person in some way, right? And which would then make, make, make uh, apparently seem like some recalcitrant uh, yeah, recalcitrance when it's in fact some kind of moral conviction. That, uh, and that might be part of why you see this galvanization is that both sides um, on the debate frame their, their issue in those terms, like who's being harmed. For example, abortion. Is it, is it uh, the mother who's being harmed, or is it the, this? This, um, this child or the, the fetus. Yeah. Uh, and that, and that, that creates that recalcitrance, even though both sides might actually have some level of humility. Yeah, it is. It's an intractable argument. So, a follow up question for some of these things. I'm wondering, because um, you didn't put up the questions that you used. Yeah. So, um, it seems to me that many of the, the ways that you were framing it when you gave examples kind of blended religious faith with social practice, questions like you believe in the American. So, did you have some questions where you said things like, you know, I I would support the marriage of my gay brother, right? As opposed to general social practice or social policy, because it seems like they're getting inflated in that way, so you have to separate them out in different measures. Um, so that's a question that's much common. Can, can you clarify just for a second sure. like what the conflate what exactly the conflation is that the general attitude and then a more so, so when it's a rise of the question about gay marriage, it's a, it's a question about legal policy yeah. and what we should allow in society, which of course has implications and strong relationships to many religious convictions. Yeah. But it's not exclusively just a religious question in the sense that it can come apart from doctrine in many cases or personal practice in many cases, yeah. individualized practice, spiritual beliefs that are disconnected from social policy and legal questions. Yeah. So that's yeah, no, that's a good point. We didn't, uh, like in that last study, we, it was, it was kind of just the quick and dirty, like one item for each thing. Like either marriage should be between a man and a woman, gays and lesbians should have the right to marry. You know, and then kind of where they, so we, didn't, we did not uh, separate kind of their religious viewpoints on maybe their social policy and to see if those were different. But I think that's, um, I think that's an interesting idea because yeah, you could have a situation where someone maybe holds a religious belief, but then also maybe holds a tolerant, more tolerant view. Well, I think about it in the different. case of abortion, right? You might say, would I be willing to have an abortion? It might not work so well for men. But um, yeah. would I be willing to have an abortion, or versus what I favor policy that legally would allow? Yeah. So, yeah that's that's personal point. practice versus general social policy comes apart. Yeah, I like that. Thank you for that. Do you think it's possible for someone to be sort of very humble, kind of obedient toward their own religious leader, maybe the leader of their church or the doctrine of their own uh, religious faith. And in that sense, they're very, they're very humility. Yeah. They sort of obey, they prostrate themselves to this authority. It's very sort of humble act. I will do whatever your bidding is. I will follow whatever you're committed. But then when they look to the other religions, then they're very close-minded. Yeah. In, in a sense, not having religious humility. So I'm wondering what your thoughts about sort of those two different things, whether, whether the, the psychological orientation towards your own religious leaders or, or yeah. texts or doctrine or whatever, versus your orientation towards other religious groups that differ from your own. You might get quite different things going on. One person might be high in one mode the other, or other people yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a great point, and I think that's true. Um, so we actually have some data that speaks uh, not exactly to that question, but a little bit, in that we also, in these studies, um, 
we ask them kind of intellectual humility toward different types of religious beliefs and values. But we also put in um, uh, a, what we call we were calling a spiritual humility scale uh, that asked about how humble the person thought that they were toward whatever they consider to be sacred or God. Um, and so we do see different different types of correlations there in that um, at least how we were measuring the spiritual humility um, was more uh, was more correlated with uh, strongly correlated with religious commitment, even with uh, more fundamentalist religious views. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is this idea of like I'm 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 not. It's almost like I'm humble toward this structure, or this this God, or, um, but but not so much toward um, people who are different. Uh, yeah, it's. Um, I don't know. I don't know quite what to make of that. Um, I don't know if maybe the spiritual humility, as we were measuring it, um, I was talking with um, Julie Exline about this, and she was wondering if maybe that's not necessarily humility, but more of a, a kind of um, following authority or, or something along those lines. Um, so I don't know if it's a, if it's a different construct that we're getting at with that, but you do see kind of a, a difference there. Thank you, Josh, for a couple of announcements. So. Uh, Let's thank Josh for this talk.